well, I guess I'm going to start. So um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here today. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, how I use Blender in uh, video game creation. So my name is Mathias Fonmarty. I'm an indie game dev. I'm a French guy, so I hope that uh, my accent won't bother you and that you will understand everything I say. If that's not the case, don't hesitate to stop me and ask me to repeat. Or um, So uh, first of all, like a lot of people, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, introduce myself, because I guess that almost nobody here knows about me, <laughs> which is quite <laughs> OK. So um, I'm a passionate French guy who creates a video game, a 3D cartoon video game. So you have a few pictures behind just to show you the kind of stuff I do. Um, my background is computer science. I come from computer science. I studied software development and all that stuff. And I learned um, 3D and painting and creation, well, artistic creation, I would say, on my own. Um, so I like to paint, uh, play music, and of course, create video games. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about how I use Blender, uh, the indie game dev style. I would say, <laughs> if uh, that means something. So a um, uh, lot of people here already know Blender. You know that it's a reference 3D tool in open source. Uh, there are plenty of applications, animated movies, CG, CGI, post-production, lots of stuff. And of course, video game too. So um, I guess a lot of people here already use Blender. So I hope that you will pick a few tips and tricks and maybe some efficiency uh, tips to well boost your, your workflow if you are creating um, 3D assets, uh, I hope so. And maybe if there are some newbies here, I hope to show some kind of um, simple overview of, uh, of Blender. I just start the chronometer. <laughs> OK, just a, a little talk about the outline. I will try to show you little tips and tricks that I use almost every day in four different uh, areas. So first, modeling, texturing, animation, and a bit of level design, too, which might be called something else if you're not in video game, for example, like, uh, set dressing or decor creation, landscape, whatever. Uh, I hope you might find something useful even if you're not in video games. Um, I will try to make quite some demos in Blender. Hopefully everything will go well. <laughs> um, so let's start uh, with modeling. So you might know it, but in video games we use uh, low poly meshes because what we aim at is uh, real-time rendering with 3D engine. Um, just by the way, I, I didn't say it, but I don't use the Blender game engine. I use some other game engine that I can talk about if you want after the presentation. But uh, I will focus on the asset creation part only, so using modeling, texturing, animation tool, but not the Blender game engine. So um, to create my 3D models, I have a very low poly approach. Uh, and I use some kind of very basic tools, but I hope I will show you here a few minor tweaks that you can use to boost your, um, your creation. So first of all, I use, of course, the loop cut. I guess almost everybody here knows the loop cut. But there is some slight um, uh, option uh, which is pretty handy, which is named the uh, UV correction. Uh, by the way, you can also use it with the simple slide tool, so I will show you this. So here I have a simple basic Blender scene and for example I will simply create, create a cube that I will uh, texture. So here I use, oops sorry, what did I just do? Okay, it starts crashing. Oh, strange stuff happens. Um, okay, so does everybody see well? Is this okay? Oh, uh, actually, <laughs> we tried a few minutes ago and we didn't find how to do this. So if somebody knows how to turn on the lights, you're welcome. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Well, except that I will use one of those panels, so I will bring it back. Anyway, um, so here I just use a simple texturing. Um, and the fact is, when you create 3D assets, very often there are iterations. You know, you start modeling, then you texture it, then you want to change the model, and you want to maybe change the texture. And it's all um, backward and forward iteration. So once you have textured a model, sometimes it's kind of a pain to remodel it because you will mess up all the UV mapping. So a nice option here, for example, if I want to add a loop cut here, you see that the default behavior is um, that it will stretch the texture if I move the new loop cut I've just created. So this sometimes is cool to create uh, deformation if you want to have a very cartoonish stuff, which is usually what I do, but sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want, uh, I will just delete this one, and create another one. And you can just check here the simple correct UV map. And then when you slide, it will automatically recompute the good UV map, which is pretty handy when you are modifying a model which is already textured. Of course, this is limited, limited to the, um, uh, well, say, clean topology when you can use uh, loop cuts. You can't you always use this, but actually it works also with the knife tool. The knife tool already keeps good UV mapping, so this this might be handy uh, handy tools not to destroy the UV map you've already done. Uh, so this was the uh, first trick. Um, I talked about the, the slide, which is the double G uh, shortcut. Maybe you already know about it, but there is the same option with the, the double G when you say Double G here, you have the, uh, oh, sorry, for, vertex for, vertex, for example, you can slide it with the, uh, the correct, wait, okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> the user interface don't show up, <laughs> I guess this is live demo. Um, anyway, you can use it with the double G uh, shortcut too. Um, I also use the trackball uh, rotation, maybe uh, you already know this. Uh, Generally, this is to pose uh, rocks on the landscape or all that stuff. You can quickly arrange and create some uh, kind of noisy pattern to just uh, put them quickly in the in the landscape. So this is really a simple shortcut that I really use often. Two other shortcuts that I use uh, quite um, quite regularly are the bridge head loops and the grid fill. I use it to create um, architectural stuff. Uh, I don't know if lots of you create uh, or use Blender to create architectural stuff, but sometimes you want just a simple hole in a wall to put a window or something like that. And it can be uh, a pain to create it. So a simple way I found to do this is, uh, let's say you have a wall here, and you want just to create a simple square hole to put your window. A quick way to do this is to use the simple loop cut then to select the faces that you want to, uh, uh, to remove and use the bridge edge loop. So you have to find it in the, in the search menu. It's not um, easily, uh, easily displayed. But as soon as you do this, it, automati it automatically connects the opposite faces. So this is, uh, uh, oh, thanks for the light. I don't know. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Uh, you, you have a question? W and E. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Oh, yeah. W. -A okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I learned something today. <laughs> Okay, so this is a way of doing it, and the other ways is the, <laughs> the famous shortcut he's just told about. Thank you. Um, um, and also, another uh, shortcut I use quite often is sometimes for my game, I create strange, uh, strange shapes for, uh, let's say, a cave or um, a level which is um, 
uh, underground or like this, and you have strange, uh, strange floor shapes like this, for example. Then you extrude the walls and you have plenty of stuff around, and sometimes architecture is a bit um, complicated, and you, you end up with some gap here to fill. A quick way to do this is to use the grid fill. Um, which in this case is a bit useless because I could have extrude, um, extruded the, the base floor, but sometimes you start from a corridor you already have and there are uh, things happening all around with holes and all that stuff. So if you simply want to fill up um, um, a cap uh, on the top of some kind of weird um, tubular things, the grill fill is kind of handy because it creates some kind of cool topology and after that you can, if you want, for example, create pillars inside the, inside the, the room, for example, with a, with a simple bridge loop. Of course, you have to refine it and, and reshape it, add maybe details, all that stuff. But this is really a handy tool when it comes to um, quickly block a level design. So this is pretty handy. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go to the texturing part now and um actually there are two sub parts there is uh, a bit of painting here and a bit of mapping UV mapping. So I will try to present you useful options still. Um so for the texturing part the first uh, the first thing that you have to take care of when you um, when you texture paint, for example, I will still use my simple cube example, um, is that uh, when when you start with a default uh, blender scene, usually you have a lamp here, and as you can see, the lamp creates shadows. This is expected, of course. Um, but when you want to texture paint here, and when you use the sampler, which is the S shortcut, you can see here on the um, uh, upper left side that the, the color picker changes, okay? But you have to know that the color you, you are picking is the color of the texture underneath, not of the, pix not of the displayed pixel exactly. For example, if I sample in the dark here, I have the color of the texture, which is, something you might expect, but visually it's, it can be misleading, especially if you don't have one light, but plenty, many lights, if you want a precise color control. What you want to do is um, just uh, delete the light or put it on another layer or whatever. And you want to use um, the, the perfect uh, texture display. Um, by the way, you have to use, uh, in if you are in texture painting mode here, so you can, okay, modify the texture, that's it. But you might want to be in texture uh, display and not solid display because solid display also creates some kind of subtle shading. So this might bother you if you are uh, a texture artist. Uh, yeah, I guess you can make it shade less. Um, I still use this technique because this is a quick and it's alt Z shortcut, but you, you can make it shadeless, of course. This is the quickest way I found at the moment, actually. <laughs> um, so that's it for the little tips about painting. Uh, now I will talk about um, subtle behavior of the basic uh, UV mapping tools. Um, as I am an indie developer, I always try to find quick ways to do things, uh, to have something which is, let's say, okay. So uh, for always, always in the, the blocking part of the, the creation. So here I will just show you the cube projection. Everything, everyone knows it, I guess. It perfectly matches the texture on the faces of the cube. One uh, curious thing is that if you move the cube in the world and you redo a cube projection, you have some kind of offset in the texture, which is usually not what you want. Um, if you want to texture uh, an object, which is not at the origin with the cube mapping, um, a simple trick is to use the cursor, the 3D cursor to just um, save the the world pose of your object, then you move the object back to, back to the center, you make cube projection, and you put the object back to the, to the cursor. So this is a good way to do it, and you have to know that the cube mapping is dependent on the uh, world coordinates of the uh, vertices of the object. 
Uh, another uh, interesting thing is that um, the scale also affects the mapping. I, I, maybe you, 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 you didn't see it. I just scale the object uh, in object mode. If I do a cube mapping here, the mapping is OK. But if I apply the scale to the mesh, and then I will do a cube projection, there is some kind of tiling happening because the scale is bigger. So you have to know when you use those basic tools that uh, the scale of the object and the position, uh, the world position of the vertices are um, affecting the UV mapping. Um, yeah, of course you can compensate this with uh, scale. Oh, funny thing. Hey, hey. <laughs> this is unexpected. At least to me. <laughs> Um, so, well, you, you have to know this kind of stuff when you want to quickly prototype. Um, I will also show you the cylinder projection. I guess uh, you already know about this. Uh, sorry, this is here, just creating some cylinder. And this UV mapping is dependent on the camera view, at least with the... Um, oh, sorry, I made a cube projection. Yeah, cylinder projection. Uh, with the default setting, it's dependent on the view. So if you want a perfect uh, default mapping, you might want to get an orthographic projection with a side view. So there, the mapping is perfect. And if you if you have if you have a different point of view, uh, perspective one, when you do the cylinder projection, you get something weird, which might. Uh, be interesting, depending on what you want, but most of the case, you don't want this. You can check the options here if you want to align, align to the object, uh, which is some kind of quick, uh, quick fix. Um, another way, uh, interesting of, um, another interesting way of doing mapping on strange objects, for example, for organic objects, not simple cube and cylinder, um, is to use the uh, follow active quad. I will show you this. Um, when you have uh, a mesh like this and you have something quite weird, like let's say this stuff happening. Well, this is awful. Okay, gonna make it better a little bit. <laughs> okay, let's say you have some kind of tree branch um, going on here. Um, a quick way to to, uh, to texture it is to use the follow active quad, which if you have already a section textured, it will propagate the, um, the texture mapping to the whole object, li just like this. And if the uh, base section is well textured with uh, uh, a good seamless mapping, the seamless property will be propagated all through the, um, all through the, the tube form, which is kind of handy too. Uh, of course, it needs, uh, there needs to be a good topology uh, behind it. You know, if you start to add vertices here and there, there will not be quads everywhere and the follow active quads won't perform very well. So you have to think about topology each time you want to, um, to map something, let's say the, the quickest way. Um, is this okay? Not too quick, not too slow, okay. The, the extrusion, uh, it's just you, se you select the face here and you just control left click and it will automatically connect. Uh, it's, a, it's a quick extrude actually. Okay, so uh, last thing about UV mapping, I will show you a real uh, level I'm working on, which is, hmm, yeah, it's called prison, but actually, actually it's more kind of a uh, messy building. Um, you see, and um, so this is a level I'm working on. It's not finished yet, so uh, really it's blocking uh, phase still. So the idea is here I have a mesh with two textures, and I quickly want to scale the, um, the stone texture that I have here. So um, when you have multiple textures, an easy way to select the same faces is to use the uh, Shift G. Um, shortcut and just select the same images, not uh, the faces with the same image. And then you can use the um, famous cube mapping, which will wrap, uh, unwrap, sorry, the object quick and dirty. So here you can see that I have kind of a problem. The, 
the texture is obviously repeating, so this is not that good. Um, what I want to do is to have some kind of uh, bigger texture. I want to modify the scale of the mapping, so um, what I would do uh, first is just scale the, the map here, but as soon as I do this, you can see that it creates seams on the, on the faces. Why is that so? It's because the building is huge and uh, only the world coordinates of the vertices are taken into account for, uh, for UV mapping. So uh, when you are using UV mapping here, you can modify the size here of the projection, which, uh, kind of, uh, which is handy. But the thing is that if afterwards you want to change the scale, uh, the same problem arises. So a way I have found to do this is to make a cube projection with a, an awfully small scale so that here, when you zoom, you can see that I have the global shape of the building and no faces are uh, separated, you see? So this way, when I scale back up, I can pretty much scale what I want. There won't be any seams, uh, at least on the faces uh, along the same direction. So this is a good way to, uh, let's say, uh, earn a few, uh, a few seconds of, uh, of work. And as I often modify the texture and stuff, yes, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yes, the smart, um, yes, it might, it might work actually. Uh, sorry, sorry, yes, the smart UV project, yeah. Uh, let's say default stuff. Yes? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get it. Yeah, 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 there might be some kind of problem with the, this because you don't know where is the up and the down, so some, yeah, here, <laughs> see, I have the, the texture upside down, which might be, Confusing. Well, it it might be some kind of other way, but I'm pretty sure UV uh, UV automatic UV unwrap can be uh, pretty useful in other situation. For maybe not for archi architectural building with the the up down textures, but definitely I use it on other stuff. <laughs> um, anyway, so cube projection, beam, 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 beam. Here it is. So uh, that's it, I guess, for the texturing parts, let's go back here. Yes, yeah, so to sum up, just be careful with the object scale and the object placement when you do auto UV mapping. Um, if you are careful with this, you can save a few minutes of work and when you are iterating every day, this can be uh, really a lifesaver. Uh, so, now let's talk a little bit about animation. So I'm not an animation guru. I've seen animation gurus out there, so I'm a pretty ashamed of what I'm going to show now. Uh, please, <laughs> please be um, merciful. So um, when you are creating video games, very useful, uh, very usually, you have a, a file for each character of the game. So here I have an eagle, and there are many animation on the same character. For example, for this eagle, I have a wing flap. I have uh, when, he, when it screams, where it, when it glides, or all, all that stuff. So the first thing you want to do when you work with multiple animation is to create fake users uh, for the animation. So I will show you a simple um, animation file I have, which is uh, here. So it's not an eagle, it's a seagull. Well, almost. <laughs> um, I just wanted to get the yeah, perspective view. So um, the idea, yeah, when you select here, uh, see I have a few animations and they're still there because I have a fake user uh, on it, you can activate here so that you tell Blender that even if the animation is not currently playing, Blender will not delete it when you close the software. So this is the first mistake you can make <laughs> when you are working on animation. You forget that, you close it, and you lose days of work. Um, 
So another important stuff when you create anim animation for video game is that you want loopable animation, uh, which Pixar don't care about, but uh, when you do video game, this is uh, um, mandatory, actually. So um, th the problem is that when you want to create cyclic uh, or loopable animation, I will start from from scratch, there are many ways. So for very simple animation, you can simply copy paste the first keyframe to the uh, the end of the animation. So I'll just show you this. Uh, I will only animate one wing here very quickly, very awfully. Uh, sorry, this way. Okay, just set up a rotation keyframe. Oops, sorry. I wasn't at the animation start. So. Here I just set up a keyframe, the same at the end of the animation, and some kind of wing flap here in the middle of the animation. When I do this, actually the animation is pretty crap, but it's perfectly looping, which is what I want. Sadly, uh, this technique is very uh, useful for very simple items where you have very simple moves. But when you have something more complicated, uh, for example, when you take into account, uh, oops, sorry, um, overlap, that is to say, oh, oh sorry, my mouse is doing uh, what it wants. Um, I will just add a little offset here in the animation. Well, an overlap, so I'm just um, uh, sliding the the, uh, the uh, keyframes. So when I do this, now if I just see here, there is some kind of, well, pretty simple overlap, but you have this sense of, of um, movement going from the base of the wing to the tip of the wing, which is quite nice at the bottom, but at the top, as soon as I play the animation, it will break on the loop part. You see, this is this is a problem. So um, it happens because the uh, the 3D. Oh, sorry. What happens with my mouse? Okay. Anyway, um, if I look at the curves here, uh, what you can see is that if I only look at the. Oh, sorry. Let's say this one. The end of the move at frame 60 is here. But when it loops back to the first frame, we have some kind of jump in the movement. So a quick way to um, solve the problem is simply to select all and use some kind of extrapolation and make cyclic. Uh, this will repeat, automatically repeat the animation before and after itself. So here you have some kind of nice looping animation. Well, uh, what happens? Oh, sorry, yeah, welcome. Okay, let's say I'm doing this. Um, how you set up the first frame? Okay, bim. Nice, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is a way of doing it, but the problem with this approach is that the uh, cyclic animation is dependent on the animation length of each bone. So if you have a bone, whose uh, keyframes are, uh, whose keyframe duration is shorter than the other bones, this will be total crap because the loop will happen in, in the middle of your animation. And it's just, you have one bone looping on 30 frames and the other looping on 60 frames and you have something quite messy. So another way I found to fix the problem is first uh, disable the cyclic animation and then so this is pretty crappy, but it works, actually. It's just simply manually duplicate and move the animation this way. It's a bit annoying because, oh, sorry, because you have to do it each time you want to make the animation loopable. So you work on the animation, then you want it to be able, so you have to copy. I guess you can create a script to do this. But what I have seen is that this technique always works. Meanwhile, the cyclic extrapolation sometimes fails. So this is a workaround, it can be handy, so take it. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, I guess that's enough for the anime. Oh no, I have something else, yeah. Uh, a simple trick I found is that when you use um, animation for uh, 3D real-time rendering, the um, scaling 
on bones doesn't work exactly the same way than in Blender. So you might have surprises when you uh, animate, for example, a character who is breathing. Um, I will show you this. Um, where is it? Uh, here, new design, that's it. So, okay, there you go. Um, anyway, so here I have a simple character that you can see here, and I have a bone which controls uh, the chest. And to uh, simulate the breathing, I only apply a simple uh, scale on the y, y and X axis uh, to uh, make the character breathe, which is mm, kind of simple, but does the trick. Uh, the thing is that I could have used the, the spine bone, but as soon as I scale the spine bone here, um, I have a problem because here in Blender, it could be okay, uh, except that the, the shoulder rises. But um, when I import this in my 3D game engine, the scale is automatically propagated to all the children bones, which is something you usually don't want. So a workaround is to use what I call a leaf child bone. This is um, a bone whose parent is the spine bone, but this scalable bone doesn't have any children, so the scale is not propagated to the arms and the neck and the head, and that way the character, uh, the scaling of the chest works properly in the game engine. So I don't show you this now because I don't have time, but this is a trick I found really useful. Um, that's it about the animation part. I think I'm gonna sh uh, uh, go on with the level design. And I will show you a few tricks here and there and how I use them to quickly create stuff for levels. So um, first of all, I tend to use a lot of snapping and proportional ed editing. So I'll show you um, a quick uh, example with um, how I put grass on the ground uh, very quickly. So here I'm gonna take the, where is it, level design, I'm on it. So here I have, oh, we do this. I have this simple grass theft here, and I want to uh, duplicate it and put it everywhere on the ground. So uh, the simplest way to do this is to activate the, the snapping, of course, but you want to select the good uh, parameters. So one that I found is um, pretty handy is to snap to the face and to put the active point of the object on the, on the ground. Uh, so, for example, I duplicate and it automatically snaps the grass theft on the ground, but it snaps the active point of the object. And the thing is that the uh, terrain has some slopes and you don't want the, um, the, uh, the grass theft uh, to be midway in the air. So if, you, if we look below the terrain, I have set up the uh, active point of the object to be a little bit above the base of the grass. That way, uh, when I move the object, I have all the uh, grass blades uh, going down to the terrain, even if we are in a slope, which is pretty handy to use with the active uh, pivot point. Uh, so uh, you can um, activate this, um, this option, which will snap multiple elements at the same time. So once you have a few grass theft, you can quickly create a few others and um, and you can move them around like this. So you have to be careful because you snap on the element that is below the object. So if you snap from the side view here, you can quickly make mistake and snap a grass stuff on other grass stuff. So you have to be careful on the angle that you use from your camera. You mainly want to use a top-down angle, which is uh, more handy. Now we have those grass tufts. They are all the same, so it's not very um, visually interesting. So what I usually do is that I use um, the proportional editing to add some kind of variety. So here you can simply, oh, sorry. You, can, you have to use the individual origin, but you can simply add some scale around here. I have a huge fall of radius here. Yeah, so you can simply and quickly add some rotation to some of the items, add some scale, and you create very easy um, 
uh, some variations on the grass tuft. So that's it for the, oh, what do I have? Oh, I have other layers. Yeah, that's a previous demo, sorry. Um, now I will finish with a real uh, level design that I have, where is it? Here. Um, so this is some kind of simple cartoonish village. And sometimes when you have a full level design like this, you want to correct a little bit, um, let's say this window here that I have, and I want to focus on it and I want to work on it. But there is so many stuff around that it's kind of cluttering the way. So a good way to work only on the, the object you want when you have a huge level design is uh, to use the local view, I guess. Um, some of you already know this trick. Uh, where is the local view? Uh, here. And you only have the building you are working on. So this is not a very um, complicated trick, but it's really useful when you have cluttered scenes. Um, another trick I use very often is the uh, repeat last action, um, which is um, shift R as a shortcut. And with this stuff, you can easily uh, duplicate, let, let's say, oh, sorry, let's say a duplicates a uh, pillar or uh, pole, uh, some kind of uh, design elements here. And you can, uh, sorry, repeat it multiple times. This is very handy when you have to create um, uh, street lamps around the street or whatever. It can be useful with many, many options, um, including merging vertices on a mesh when you are cleaning, all that stuff. This is really handy. The last thing I use um, is, um, sorry? Uh, shift R, repeat last action. Yeah. And the last thing I use is empty objects. I use lots of these, and this is, I guess, quite specific to my level design approach. The idea here is that um, there is some kind of line between between the, the buildings and the trees and whatever, and there are those empty objects. Actually, if I select this one, you might see that it has a specific name. It's called Paper Lantern. And why I do this is that I want to uh, this point um, to hold a paper lantern, but the thing is I don't want to uh, have it repeated uh, 200 times on the level. I want to save uh, disk space and time loading, so I only put a frame which is some kind of reference position, and then when I load the level in my game engine, I dynamically change the frame with the specific name with the complex game object I have, because it's not only a model of a paper lantern, it also has um, some kind of behavior. It moves with the wind, there are some fireflies around, it lights up or it lights on or off, depending on the weather, all that stuff. So um, the thing is that when I load the level into my game, it dynamically replaces all that um, uh, complex object, I would say, smart objects, uh, and it keeps the Blender file quite uh, easy to read and to, um, to load. So I guess um, I have finished with, with all that little tips and tricks. I hope that you picked something that you didn't know. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me by email. If you're curious about what I do, my game is try, you can go on my website. There is a free demo. You can check it out. Tell me what you think about it. You can check out the blog. I have many articles and posts. So thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>